Okay, it is now 5.10, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you the next speaker from Austin, Texas, Garrett Montgomery. Hi. Hello, thank you. So, I'm going to talk about myself for a second. My name is Garrett Montgomery. I'm a security researcher. I work at Breaking Point, now a part of Ixia, and I focus on the security side of the house. Prior to my work at Breaking Point, I was a signature developer for an IPS company. And prior to that, I worked as a snort analyst for the military. So I have some background, and I'd like to think that I know what I'm talking about. Hopefully, by the end, you'll agree. OK, so today, we are going to talk about what is a protection device, at least from my perspective, why people should care about defense in depth. What do you mean my protection device isn't protecting me? Shocker, right? So I'm going to talk about my testing setup, because I'm fairly proud of it. I'll talk about some of the initial results we've got. I will cover why we don't have specifics on your particular protection device, but I will talk about how you can get some of those results yourself for those with some budget, limited budget, and no budget. And then I'll summarize at the, uh, at the end in case you guys have all forgotten what we're talking about. So first off, for myself, and the work that I do, we're looking at network-based protection devices. These include IPS devices, next generation firewalls, unified threat management systems, basically anything that sits on the network that is supposed to block bad traffic one way or another, whether it's inline, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five in some cases. And so we're looking at statistics and how well they do what they say they're gonna do, which is protect you from the bad stuff. So, as an example, we have here IPS. Devices that would sit here, next generation firewall, IPS, UTM, those are the devices that we're covering in this talk today. So, some of you may recognize some of these. They are lists of vulnerabilities that are claimed to be covered by network protection devices, such as an IPS, Next Generation Firewall, UTM. There are various ways to find them. Sometimes you can find them on a company website. Sometimes you have to own the device and you have to know how to go and find it. And so they provide a list of things they claim to protect you against. So what we have done is try to verify those claims. You say you protect me against a certain vulnerability. I expect you will protect me against all forms of that vulnerability and all exploits that may attempt to target that vulnerability. And that's what the research is all about. So protection is relative. What do you mean I'm not protected against that exploit? If you saw the previous list, you might think, oh, I have a great IPS. They protect me from all these vulnerabilities. And the only difference between them is maybe some devices have more protection. They have more vulnerabilities on their list. So that makes them better, right? Well, I don't think that's going to be the case. So there's a lot of different ways to exploit vulnerabilities. You may see a public proof of concept, which represents one type of exploit for that particular vulnerability. So one of the things that I do at my job is to find all the other ways to exploit a particular vulnerability. And believe me, it's a super fun job. You spend a lot of time watching things crash, popping calc, and just riding on the coattails of others who do really cool exploit development work. And all I have to do is just find the other 100 ways, 1,000 ways that uh, you can target a vulnerability. And then we put that out as a product. So yes, some devices we'll find are better than others. So my testing framework is a dedicated security lab environment. And that means I have hardware devices, I have software devices, I have a hardware switch. I've got virtual networking via ESX. Uh, we have a traffic generating device, which is where we generate our exploits. Again, Breaking Point is the company that I work for. We make a high throughput device. Not that it's a sales pitch, but that's where I generated all my test data from. So we've got eight of those in hardware and 12 of those virtualized devices. We've got a layer three management switch for the hardware. And we've got ESX networking where we can change the uh, 
connections between the devices and so we have single paths in a virtual environment so you know where the traffic's going and you are verifying that the uh, protection devices are seeing that traffic. So what we've done in the hardware and the reason this is complicated is because I made do with what I have. So many of you will probably have to do the same thing if you want to do some of this testing yourself. You're probably not going to get a lot of budget. Your superiors may say, we have an IPS device. They're a breaking point customer. Why should we do our own testing? I'm sure they do all their own testing and they block everything that breaking point has, right? No need to verify anything on your own. So in order to prove the concept of my project, I found an old switch. I used static MAC addresses on the input ports and the output ports, and I used VLANs to segment the traffic, and that's how I can direct traffic from any traffic generation device through a DUT, which is a device under test, back to the reception port to check whether the traffic got through or not, and then back out if need be, because some exploits, they start from the client side, sometimes they start from the server side. So that's my setup. Now, I have a list of devices you guys are all likely familiar with. These are included as part of our test bed. Not all of them are included as part of the result set. And I will not be talking about specific results because many of them are our partners. And while I don't want to name and shame, I do want to point out that as a general rule or a, a class, a class of protection device, we are gonna point out how well those devices are doing so that you can go follow up and say, my device falls into a certain class type like enterprise level or open source or it's a next generation firewall. Maybe I should test my own device and check these results myself. One of the things we plan to do is publish the test methodology, test methodology so that if you are a breaking point customer, you can repeat these same results yourself. So, unfortunately, The test devices in our lab did not perform as well as I would have hoped. This is an initial look at the data. Basically, I ran 10 tests, in some cases 14. I had many older devices that I didn't have the budget to update, uh, or I didn't have the time to update in time for this conference. Um, so we have test devices that were older, and we only tested up to the age of their previous rule set update. We have some test devices that are newer that had a limited demo license. We couldn't fully test all of their features, but if they're in line and they're claiming to be update, we use those results. And we have some devices that we actually do have licensed. So there is a good mix of results in here. And as you can see, network layer attacks. Those are things that I would say are TCP based, ICP based, uh, maybe even ICMP, where you're looking at say buffer overflows in the option fields or um, out of bounds values in certain header fields. Infrastructure layer, those bytes on the wire are basically fixed. The only way to attack that is to have certain bad values in certain places and that's what a protection device would see on the wire. I would expect a protection device that's network based to do a much better job than that. We've got about a 16% detection ratio and it's possible I didn't configure it very well but guess what? Not everybody has perfectly configured devices on their network. If it's difficult to set up, then maybe your protection device isn't set up either. These results aren't invalid because I don't know how to set it up, but I'm a customer, and so I think the vendors need to do a better job of making it easier to configure and use their devices if they have better protection statistics in their own test labs. And I'd like to think that they do have test labs. So browsers, HTML typically being served from a server where you have a client, reach out and get it. That's always hard for a firewall because the connection comes from inside the network. So this is gonna be IPS protection alone. We have a lot of strikes and these variants. What I mean by that are the different ways that an exploit can target a vulnerability. Some of these strikes, which are exploits, are they have many, many variations, hundreds or even thousands that are just significantly different enough to confuse an IPS. And I'll be showing some examples of that later. User applications like Adobe, they make a, um, a PDF application that some of you may use. Uh, Flash is possibly considered a user application. It may also be considered a browser-based attack because it typically comes from the browser. 
not surprisingly, they did quite poorly in that. Infrastructure, what would I mean by infrastructure are attacks that can come from somewhere on the network or outside of the network that without having to be passed or interpreted or parsed can directly attack your server. Say uh, denial of service or HTTP servers where you overflow a parameter. Those are things that uh, basically an attacker can do as a fire and forget. They don't have to initiate any um, sessions. They don't have to do much other than send bad stuff to the server and you crash the infrastructure. These are particularly important for companies that like to keep an internet presence. They want to have hosts that are alive on the internet. So as you can see again, they did a little bit better, which is good. You, you want them to do well. And we, we all want, everyone wants your IPS vendor to do well because we all want to be secure. So these results that I'm showing aren't to talk bad about a vendor or say any particular vendor sucks or that the technology is bad. This is an attempt to raise awareness in the hopes that customers will go tell their vendors, I can do a better job. I saw this exploit being passed by the firewall. Fix it. I have a feeling that many customers will have much more effect and be heard by their vendors than, say, a test company who makes a product and doesn't want to anger those partner customers. So I want you guys to do my dirty work for me. Go tell your vendors that they're doing poorly and you can prove it. And that's what we're going to continue talking about in the presentation, how you guys can tell the vendors to get better. So one example, there is a vulnerability, CVE 2015-099. It is a browser-based exploit. Our strike, which is what we call the attack. 288 variants. And what we mean by that is different combinations of code placed in different places that fundamentally achieve the same thing. They exploit the vulnerability in the same way, but they show up on the network. They traverse the network in a different way. They are in the file in a slightly different way. And we've lost... It's back. Okay, so in this example, we have browser-based exploit, which was tied to CSS rules, cascading style sheets. We have these arrows here to indicate the slight variations between the two exploits, which are two of the 288 variants. You can see here, there is a percentage value used. In the other one, we used a default value you have the animation specified below versus animation specified in a different way. So these show up on the wire and are inspected by protection devices in a slightly different manner, but they are in the end interpreted by the browser in the same way. So they hit the same vulnerability just using a different attack vector. And unfortunately, um, they don't do so well. What I found, I posted a blog about this, and that's why when you guys get the PowerPoint, you can go look at my self-promotion link, which is a previous blog post where I talked specifically about this vulnerability. In essence, 288 of them were blocked. 144 were blocked because they triggered on a rule for JavaScript obfuscation. That's all it looked for was lots of multiple encodings of JavaScript. And for those of you who have looked at HTML source pages, you will find that encoding JavaScript isn't a bad thing. It's a very common practice. And if you have an IPS where you're relying on JavaScript obfuscation, you will probably find that you're going to get too many false positives and you're going to have to turn off this rule. So this vulnerability would then be blocked zero times because even without JavaScript obfuscation, the IPS didn't block it. Okay, so I know it's very tiny print, but that is the source code behind the google.com homepage. And that's the example of obfuscated JavaScript that I'm referring to. There's a lot of JavaScript. It's encoded for size. It's also encoded in some cases to protect intellectual property, making it a little more difficult for somebody to copy your JavaScript. So that's the type of stuff that you'll see on the wire because you're looking at source when you're looking at packets that are going across the wire. And it gets interpreted by the browser's nice, clean Google page. So obfuscated JavaScript is not a valid detection methodology. Don't rely on obfuscated JavaScript to protect you from attacks. 
So, what about my device? As I said, we're not gonna be releasing specific metrics and statistics on a per device basis, but we will be talking about classes, and that will be included at data, in, in data that is hopefully gonna be released by the end of the year. For this talk, we're gonna be just be talking about how you can apply some of the same principles that I use in my daily job to do some of this testing yourself. So we've got direct firewall testing, demo testing, and virtualized testing. So if you are lucky enough where you have access to your own firewall, you could hook up a couple of ports on each side of the inbound and outbound interfaces, maybe set up a VLAN, and then use something like TCP replay with uh, split interfaces, and you could send the traffic. You can send it from either side, and you could see if your IPS is blocking it. Not too difficult. And if you had a public proof of concept on your laptop, you can generate a PCAP from it by downloading it from somewhere if it's, say, an HTML-based strike, or if it's any other type of exploit, you could send it across the network and get a PCAP. TCP replay that can then be used to send it out either interface. So you can check with your own I IPS de or protection device with your own configuration, and you also get the benefit of seeing if next generation firewall type rules such as uh, IP block lists and application filtering help in preventing the traffic that's bad from passing through these interfaces. So if you have a ESX host, you might have a little bit more of a budget, maybe not a whole lot, but uh, you could do some configuration like we have. We, we have a limited budget, but we managed to set up some virtual switches, and then we have a large list of IPS devices, and at this time, we're configuring them where one at a time for each interface, we hook it up to one of these switches, and then we pass traffic from a server that has the bad stuff. In our case, these breaking point devices that can send a lot of bad stuff. So we send traffic from one interface to the other, it gets routed only to that dot, and then it comes back, and then we keep track of whether it blocked it or didn't block it. You could do something similar in your own setups. And Ansible is where we're migrating to because I am a fan of automation and I don't like configuring interfaces myself manually. So the high level concept is you have a management interface that's out of band, you'd have one virtual switch where you would pass traffic in and another virtual switch where you would pass traffic out after it hits the protection device. And you can also set up a third virtual switch that could be in line if you have any servers that you want to practice beating up, like uh, the vulnerable bank applications. Set up a target server, put your protection device in line, see what it does. This is a good uh, use case for demos. Often you can get 30 days from a vendor. If you already have a configuration, you may even be able to import it from your own device and you get a fairly decent replica of what is on your network and you get a sense of what your protection level is with a real live device just in an isolated environment. So, local testing in line. So this is basically something you would do on your own system, which is what I usually do because it's a lot more convenient for me to test this way. The device at the top, say, would be a gateway or a routed virtual machine. You could put two interfaces, you create two internal networks, say a dot .100 and dot .200, and you have that be the bridge interface. On the two systems, you set up, say, a default route so that they just automatically send traffic to that gateway device and then traffic gets passed back and forth. What I like to do is have a shared folder on my host where I can edit the target or edit the exploit in real time and I can work on the client and then request it from the server and then I can change it and continue to do so and I can see if there's uh, traffic getting blocked and that in that case I hope it's the IPS, I hope I configured my device right, I hope it's the protection device that's dropping packets, but then I can also find that if it's not, I know that's a fail on that particular exploit variant. An easier setup, which is the one I'm going to demonstrate today, is you basically have one internal network, you connect your client device, your server device, and your IDS type device. You set it up in promiscuous mode and just have it sniff the traffic and see what it can get. Uh, for this example, I've used Security Onion, which has Snort and Bro and Circot and a bunch of other security tools. Great, great virtual machine host for testing things because you should be able to configure everything on the device. 
Um, and so, yeah, I keep my, my exploits in a shared folder that's accessible by the server, and then I can go visit it from my client where I'm doing the requests and where I'm doing the editing, and the server serves it, and usually it's out of the, I don't even have to see it once I verify network connectivity. So here's the demo portion, fingers crossed. Here I've got a server. You can see the IP address is 10.0.2.4. And security onion. If you'll bear with me one second, I have to re log in. Okay, now over here you can see that there are some alerts. I just left this up there because I wanted to prove to you at some point that these rules did fire on the exploits that it's going to be seeing on the traffic because, shockingly enough, they're difficult to detect and they don't always work. Um, just as an example, the exploit vulnerability example I'm going to be talking about is for CVE 2014-6332, which is a vulnerability in Internet Explorer, and it has to do with VB script. So, let's see. We had, oh, Security Onion has 23 snort rules from the base distribution as well as community rules. So they're really trying to catch this vulnerability. Okay, so here's my client where I've got the folder open. You can see I have an IP address on the same subnet. It's 10.0.2.15. And here, for this vulnerability, 2014.6332, I've got eight variations of this. So what I would do is open a new tab. Nothing happens, right? But if I refresh it, we get a crash, right? So let's see if Security Onion caught it. Not this time. Well, let's try again. Another crash. Security Onion still has not caught it. Try one more time just to make sure this really gives Security Onion a chance. Which in this case it's running stored underneath, and that's the rules that it's using to try and find this vulnerability. So we've got another crash, and it still hasn't triggered. So this could go on and on, and we could keep doing it, and sometimes it'll trigger and sometimes it won't, but this is just a way to illustrate my point. There are public proof of concepts, and you can see there's several rules used to try and catch the vulnerability for this, but HTML is very difficult to detect on the wire, something I learned from my prior experience. So there's 23 versions of this rule, not one of them caught three different versions of the exploit. This isn't to say that Snort is a bad tool, it's an excellent tool, and it's included in a lot of the top of the line products for a good reason. But the point here is that exploits, there's a lot of exploits, and they're difficult to detect. So please, please go do your own testing and you can do very similar things to this. In fact, I'll show you, I think I had an example up previously. So you can see, subtle differences. You have an HTML file and there's a script that's VB script and we're not even gonna get into what they are but they're just minor differences and how the script is generated. You have different randomized names for functions. But the point is minor differences and the rules don't block them. They need to do a better job. So that is basically the point of this demo. So. All right, so that's me wrapping up. What were we talking about? Again, network protection devices are valuable. You should have them. Defense in depth is key. You want to have that. The more chances you give something a chance to protect you from bad stuff, the lower your risk profile. But be aware that just because an IPS says it's going to block you, block something for you, doesn't necessarily mean that it will. Verify it yourself, please, and then follow up with your vendor. Anytime you can get a network packet capture, they love those. Or if you can get the exploit itself and they have to send it across the wire, they will find a way to do it. If there are enough customers 
complaining, they may make a change. And if there are enough customers sending the same things with the same simple evasions, maybe they will put the detection logic into all of their rules and we all get more security that way. So last time, please take an active role, verify your coverage claims, and then follow up with your vendor. That is all for my talk. Does anybody have any questions that they want others to hear? I see a hand. That's a good question. Let's go back. We, the question was, how many unique vulnerabilities did we check, and how many variations of those vulnerabilities did we check? OK. OK, so for the test results that I'm showing here, these are initial results. They haven't been categorized. We have individual strikes, which are basically the exploit targeting the vulnerability. And uh, within those, you had many variations. Now you had a follow-up question. Well, okay, so the exploits and the variants come from the very expensive product that my company makes. So that is the first answer, yes, it, it's not free. But you can use a tool like Metasploit, ExploitDB. They have public proof of concepts. Go in there, modify them a little bit. See if you can make your protection device miss. Um, that's what we have found, and that's where we feel that we add a lot of value, is we'll even find public proof of concepts that do something one way, and then we'll do it 100 other ways. You guys can do one or two ways. It, it takes some time and practice, but please do that, and we'll all get more secure or at least lower our risk in some way if we can make our protection devices better. So unless there are any more questions. Oh, I got one down here. Ooh, HTML exploits and why are they hard to detect? Well, let's see. OK, so this is a packet capture. Wireshark, you've got a session that was initiated, typically a GET request, and then the server's responding with the HTML file. When you're looking at this on the wire, which is where most of the protection devices operate, you're seeing bytes. So in this case, Stort and those who are familiar with it know that a lot of protection is regular expression based. So you'll look for, say, in this case, you'd want to find keyframes followed by perhaps an overly large percentage with a specific opacity. Then you'd want to find that the animation was used. So ordering in this particular variant means you have to write a regular expression that looks for one thing, jumps to another, and possibly captures one thing, and then looks for it further down the line. Now, if I change the order in any way, which you can do with HTML very easily, you'll basically have to write another version of that regular expression, and now it has to check two different ways and then over here, you see we did it totally different. We did it within a style tag. or we, They were both done in style tags, but uh, we have a CSS rule rather than a HTML attribute on the style. So you have to look for it in yet a third way. And you don't typically want to write multiple rules for the same thing unless you're snort and you're open source. And so the protection vendors want you to think they're doing a very good job. They have one rule, but it could be very performance intensive. And unfortunately, since most of them are in line, performance is still key for them. They are concerned about affecting performance. So detection ratios sometimes lag because of that. Follow up? Rules based on non-regular expressions. Uh, there are probably several more people who can speak better to that, but I believe um, Suricata is a little bit higher up in abstraction and can work on possibly interpreted things at, at, at a higher level. Uh, I'm not familiar with the tool myself, but I believe there are tools that kind of straddle the line between network-based and host-based, where you're looking at the things that have been interpreted. And, and sandbox tools are great as well because they evaluate things within a safe environment before passing them on. Did I see another question? Yes.
That the question was about if IPSs are so bad, then why should anybody spend any money on it? Because they seem to be really bad. And then you get one a high cost typically, and you get false positives that have to be chased down, or you have to spend a lot of time tuning your IPS. That's a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. I, I'd like to think that if I spend some time tuning it, which I hope you guys have all had the vendors come in and help you tune it appropriate to your environment, I, I would hope that upfront time will serve you well in seeing your own detection rates at least be hopefully higher. I, I would certainly hope that anything at the network base layer should be near 100%. And it could just be because I didn't configure my devices correctly. But out of the box, testing with a default a policy applies to me is a statistical probability that some people somewhere out there have their devices like that. So we should include that as part of our testing. Did that answer your question in any way? So the question is, do, if you spend a bunch of time tuning it towards particular vulnerabilities, do you get a better coverage rate? And how does that affect you when new vulnerabilities come out? Well, you, you shouldn't have to tune for vulnerabilities. You may have to tune a device with a configuration that's appropriate for your network. You may want to block all IP addresses that are based in a foreign country if you have no foreign customers and you have no foreign business contacts. If you're uh, doing business to business networks, you may only want to have those IP ranges from that you know communicate with your network. So it's, it's not so much about making your IPS be as good as possible, which it'd be nice if, it, if they did. It, it's about lowering your risk profile and lowering, reducing the attack surface. And, an inline device can help, and it, it should, I think, be viewed as a piece of the puzzle. But just by seeing a vulnerability listed as being offered protection, don't take the vendors at, at face value. So yes, it's a big investment, and ideally, it will help lower your risk profile and reduce your attack surface so that if your follow-on mitigations have less work to do, you have less manual inspection to do, your host IPS and IDS and your host antivirus should have less work to do. At least that's the goal. So I'm still a big fan of trying to stop things one time at the network so that you don't have to stop them many times on the host. But maybe that's just my opinion. <laughs> Any other questions? I saw a hand. How old are the vulnerabilities? Well, in some cases, we went back as far as 2002, which most people should have patched by now. Those shouldn't be things that we care about. But at the same time, the IPS vendor should have had plenty of time to block those. We also had a large number or, or significant number of IPSs that we didn't have recently licensed. So we tested older vulnerabilities in order to test their older detection logic. So these vulnerabilities are from 2002 through 2016. I see a hand right here. I, I have to hope it's because I did something wrong. I, I'm really hoping my IPSs are not this bad and that with a default configuration, they don't do this poorly. I really hope that. I hope all of your results are much higher and that you have tuned interfaces they sent an engineer out to help you configure it when you first bought it. Hopefully, hopefully it's much higher than this. Any other questions? Well then, oh wait. The question I believe was about performance, hardware versus virtual. Unfortunately, I had no overlap in devices, so I couldn't tell you. But I would imagine if your device is configured for lower throughput, you should have the same detection logic regardless if it's hardware or software. Just from a developer's perspective, you want to develop once. So detection logic shouldn't be different. Yes? Did you find that they found a 
that is the additional research that I want to do because I believe that there are plenty of public proof of concepts. I have a feeling that the vendors are going after the public proof of concepts, blocking them and claiming coverage. And then we do additional work to see what other ways you can exploit a vulnerability. So at some point I hope to have statistical data showing public proof of concept versus say our variations. Any other questions? No, well if that's it, that's all. <laughs>